Welcome to the Health Woman Podcast. Today is Monday, August 3rd, 2020. Today we start a short mini-series of two podcasts on the fourth trimester. The fourth trimester refers to a time right after delivery until about six weeks later. This is also called the postpartum period. The term fourth trimester was created to indicate how even though the baby has been born, there is still a lot of pregnancy-related things going on in the mother, and not to incorrectly assume that once delivery happens, the pregnancy journey has ended. In today's podcast, Dr. Sarah Costant and I talk about recovery from vaginal and cesarean delivery. In this podcast, we discuss the recovery immediately after delivery, in the first few days after delivery, and the first few weeks after delivery. We talk about what to expect, what kind of advice we give, and what women might experience in the hospital and after they go home. On Thursday, Dr. Stephanie Lamb and I will be discussing the postpartum visit, which is usually around six to eight weeks after delivery. Hopefully, these podcasts will be useful for women towards the end of pregnancy or those who delivered recently. Also, it should be helpful for anyone who has a friend or family member who recently delivered to help us understand a little better what women might be going through with their recovery. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. Okay, Sarah Costant, welcome back to Healthful Woman. So happy you're here. Thanks. I survived the first time. So yeah. now I'm back. <laughs> Sarah, is, although she's a natural podcaster and public speaker, she has yet to convince herself that that's the case. <laughs> uh, so we're working on it. We're talking about a topic today that comes up a lot, obviously, recovery from delivery. And we have lots of people who deliver in our practice, lots of people deliver in general. And I think the whole pregnancy, people are focused on the pregnancy and what's going to be with the delivery. And maybe people are focused and don't ask us, but we don't seem to be answering a lot of questions about recovery until it's actually happening. And we thought this might be a good opportunity to talk about it, to give people maybe just sort of a background of what to expect or what it's going to be like. We, we are, as you said, really focused on the pregnancy. And I heard the postpartum period one time referred to as the fourth trimester. Right. And I think it's important because the postpartum period, it's a time of a lot of change, both physical and emotional. And while most women do very well and have good recoveries from both a C-section and vaginal delivery, there are definitely concerning things that women should look out for. And I also think that a lot of women, this is a period of time where a lot of women may compare themselves to other women if they have sisters or friends who delivered. And a lot of women feel like they may be having a hard time and think that, oh, it's just me. But really, like I, I always reassure any patient that comes for a postpartum visit that anything that they're going through that's difficult, whether it's physical or emotional, is shared by a lot of other women. And they're, you know, they're not alone in their concerns. Right. And I think that goes both directions. Sometimes when people compare themselves to others, it's sort of a downer because they're like, oh my God, my friend had such an easy recovery and I'm having such a miserable one. And they think there's something wrong with them. When in fact, they may be having a very typical recovery and right. their friend was quite lucky or on the opposite side, you know, it may be, you know, my recovery is not great, but my friend had it so much worse. So I really shouldn't complain when in fact there is something going on and they should. And I think it's, it's probably wise not to compare yourself to somebody else because uh, you don't really, there's so many possibilities and such a wide range of how people can recover. It's really not going to ultimately be helpful just to compare yourself to one or two other people. Yep. And that's why we're here. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've, I've delivered a lot of babies and never myself had one, you know, I've, I've children, but you know, I think people forget delivery is a big deal. I mean, it's this, you know, only in the past hundred years have we sort of like just assume mothers are going to deliver and, you know, walk out of the hospital. Okay. And everything's going to be fine. I mean, it used to be a very serious medical slash surgical event for women, which was a risk for their lives and certainly for their well-being. And, you know, okay, so we've, you know, we fortunately moved away from that, at least in, you know, most parts of the world. But we shouldn't forget that a lot happens at delivery. I mean, that that can cause issues with recovery. Women, they lose a lot of blood potentially. They've been, you know, they've been in labor for a long time, which is a taxing on their body. There's a lot of fluid changes. You know, they take a lot, they come in, come out. You know, they have tears, they have pain. I mean, there's a lot that happens. And so 
it's it's expected that there is a real recovery period from delivery. Absolutely. Like I think how many people can say they had a major abdominal surgery and then had to come home like with also this little person that now requires 24-hour care while they themselves are, you know, healing from either an abdominal incision or even a vaginal or perineal laceration, even if they had a, a full term or what we would call a relatively uncomplicated vaginal delivery or C-section, they're coming home, have to recover from that with a newborn, also with other small little you know children that they have to take care of as well. It's hard enough to just come home and recover from surgery with no other responsibilities. So I think that just makes it even harder for, for women. A hundred percent. And we start talking about the recovery. I mean, some of it we do during pregnancy, although again, mostly not. We really start talking about it right away. I mean, I start discussing recovery literally right after the baby's born. I start talking even while I'm doing the repair. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about what it's like when their epidural is going to wear off, when you're going to get out of bed, when you're going to go to the bathroom, what the pain is going to be like. And we start talking about it throughout their stay in the hospital, whether that's one, two, or three days. And what, what kind of things do you sort of prep women for right after delivery. And we're going to start, you know, just to sort of organize this because there's there's so many ways this can go. I think what we're going to probably do is we're going to talk first about vaginal deliveries and then we'll go on to C-section. Some of there's some there's overlap obviously with some of that, but there's differences. And then we'll start with sort of the immediate period after delivery, then we'll talk about the first few days after delivery and then we'll go to like the weeks and months. So in terms of the immediate period after delivery, what do you warn women about or talk to women about right after they delivered, like the first few hours after delivery? I do the same thing that you do. When I have a patient who has a vaginal delivery that has a, a vaginal or perineal repair, as I'm doing the repair, I'll sometimes tell patients, you know, everything's going well. You're going to have multiple dissolvable stitches that should be go gone by the time you come for your postpartum visit. This area is going to be sore, uncomfortable for the next at least few days significantly. It should go down from there, but some women depending on the degree of the tear, may have pain even for two or three weeks. Obviously, it should get continue to get better, but they may still have some soreness when they sit down or walk. So I'll encourage them immediately postpartum. I'll tell them that the nurse is going to give you a pad with an ice pack to reduce swelling. I'll encourage them to use the the dermaplast spray that we have available for them just to, it provides like a cooling sensation to the area. And I'll also stress that they really should try to take at least the first day or two, Motrin and Tylenol around the clock just to help with the discomfort. I think a lot of patients really try to avoid pain medication sometimes. And, and this is where I stress to patients, the first two or three, whether you have a vaginal delivery or C-section, the first two or three days, take the pain medication. You may not need narcotic pain medication, but honestly, for some patients with a significant vaginal or perineal tear, tear I'll tell them you should actually consider taking Dilaudid the first couple of days, which is what we usually prescribe, just so you have some better pain control. I don't think you're necessarily going to need it at home, but I, I will tell them to expect, depending on the degree of the tear, that they will have pain that may, you know, make it much more difficult for them to, to you know, to walk or, or even just sit. They may need to sit on something soft as well. I'll also go over the care of the area while they're in the hospital. We usually recommend that every time they use the bathroom, they um, wash the area with a spray bottle, and I tell them to, to take that home with them so that every time they use the bathroom, they can just irrigate the area. It's a kind of a non-invasive way to clean the area. And I also tell them there's nothing else special you need to do for, for vaginal and perineal repairs. They usually actually heal pretty quickly, even though it may not feel like they're healing quickly. There's not much more that needs to be done really to help the natural healing process. So pain medication, keeping the area, you know, clean, and also giving, you know, warning signs that even while they're in the hospital, if the pain is just excruciating, it, it should not be that bad. And we would want to even come back later that day or, you know, if I'm on call and I hear someone, I hear that someone's requiring narcotic medication repeatedly for a perineal tear, I'll go up and, and see that patient because I'll want to make sure that there's no collection of blood like a hematoma or there's no separation that's occurred in the stitches as well. So I kind of tell them what pain is normal and what pain you know we should be called for. Right. And there's so many important things you said there. Right when someone delivers, as you were saying, most women, especially on their first baby, are going to tear to some degree. And Usually, that's something that happens just naturally from the baby coming out. Occasionally, it's with an episiotomy, which is where we do the tearing for them. 
uh, sort of like surgically that used to be done on everybody and then it became less routine. And now it's it's more the exception than the rule. Some people require episiotomies and that's its own podcast, like who should and shouldn't get one. Uh, but usually it's a natural tear and that's very common. And But we, there are degrees of tears. We, we call them ourselves, you know, first degree, second degree, third degree, fourth degree. The average is probably a second degree on a first baby. But there's also, you know, second degree is more the depth of the tear that when we say degrees, you can have a and there's also the length of it and how much of it is internal versus external because internal tends to hurt less versus external tends to hurt more because it's actually on the skin, which has more pain fibers. And so while, like I said, while I'm doing the repair based on, I'll tell them, you know, you have a very small tear, you have a medium size, you have a big one, and sort of to set them up what to expect pain wise. So someone who has a very small tear or no tear will have almost none of that kind of pain. They may be a little swollen, maybe a little sore, but it won't be so bad. Whereas someone has a very large tear, certainly a third or fourth degree tear, that's like a real, it's an incision. It's like a surgery, an operation in their perineum. It's not as bad perhaps as a C-section, but it's still pretty significant and they will need more pain medicine. And like you said, so we go over that at the time. But even for women who don't have tear, there's other things that happen sort of immediately at the time of delivery that we're thinking about, for example, how much blood are they losing? And so someone who's lost a very small amount of blood, we generally think they'll be fine. They're not going to be particularly weak or dizzy or tired, but sometimes people lose a, more blood for one reason or another. And we sort of warn them, hey, you lost more blood. We're going to check your blood count. You may be weak or dizzy. Let us know. Occasionally, you may need a blood transfusion. That's rare, but it does happen. Or maybe you're going to have to start taking more iron to build your blood counts up. And, you know, that's another thing we think about immediately. And then also the uterus starts contracting down. And so the uterus goes from the size of like a beach ball to the size of a softball within like an hour. And so there's a lot of, that's contractions. And so people have it after delivery. And as their epidural, if they have one, wears off, they're going to get pain in their belly also, cramping. It's almost like a second labor to a certain degree. If they didn't have an epidural, it would be going on continuously. And these are the things we talk about. When do you tell women in terms of like epidural wearing off in delivery, when should they try to get out of bed the first time after a delivery? I mean, I usually tell patients that um, once they're upstairs, they'll probably within a few hours need to go to the bathroom. That's a good opportunity to try to get up and walk, but only with assistance. Yeah. So we'll usually, I'll tell patients, you always have to call someone to help you stand up. I tell patients that, you know, whether it's a a C-section or a vaginal delivery that, you know, once if they if they had a catheter, because again, not everyone with a vaginal delivery has a catheter in their bladder to drain their bladder unless they you know, had an epidural for a long period of time. I encourage patients to try to get up as soon as they're able to, you know, stand on their feet and take steps. And if they stand up with a nurse's assistance and they feel dizzy or lightheaded or a little weak, we'll have them lay back down and you know, wait, wait a couple hours. But the sooner that you can, you know, get up and, and walk, the better it is just for, you know, preventing blood clot in your legs. And it actually just helps women feel better as well. Yeah, I think that I, I, I say the same thing. I always encourage people to try to get out of bed and walk around. But I always tell them the first time they get out of bed, they shouldn't do it alone, even if their delivery was perfect. Mm -hmm. Because number one, if they had an epidural, they want to be 100% sure that their legs are, you know, strong enough because there's, you know, there's nerve blockage there. Number two, a lot of women are just a little bit wobbly or a little bit dizzy or lightheaded after delivery, either from the blood loss or the fluid shifts or just the stress of it, or they haven't slept in a long time. And so I always tell them the first time you get out of bed, make sure someone helps you. Once you can stand on your own, then women get in and out of bed as they, as they want to. It's that point when they can stand on their own that they could shower obviously. And, you know, they can go to the bathroom on their own afterwards. And that's, that's an important event sort of in the immediate period after delivery. And so like right after women deliver, we're focusing on how much blood do they lose? How much pain do we expect them to be in because of their tear, you know, whether that an epidural or not. And then also our, you know, when should they get out of bed? And then typically from that point, they're in a more recovery place, like the postpartum floor, typically, uh, again, after vaginal delivery, they're upstairs. Usually their baby's with them or in the nursery. And they're there until a day or two later. And during that period of time, you know, what are the types of things that you you go over with them? And you mentioned about keeping the 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 laceration, the tear clean. And that's a lot of women are are very squeamish about that or have are very worried about that. But generally, like you said, the area heals very well. I think what the nurses typically help the help women do is after they go to the bathroom, they use a spray bottle to keep it clean, or they say, you know, just take a shower after you go to the bathroom. 
and just let soap and water get on the stitches. And and they can get the stitches wet and they can get soapy. They just we tell them not to scrub them, not like anybody would think about it or consider doing that on their own. Uh, and then they just have to dry it. There's no covering to it. There's no, you know, lotions or potions. The spray you mentioned is really just for numbing and cooling just to make them feel better. But other than maybe their tear, what are the other things that happen in the first couple days in the hospital after after they deliver? So I always go over with patients, whether they've had a C-section or vaginal delivery, that they can expect more swelling in their legs. Sometimes mm, it's yeah. actually worse than it was at the end of their pregnancy, yeah. which worries a lot of women. That's probably one of the first things like... If, if I think of all the things that patients ask me when I round postpartum, Why my pizza swollen? they'll usually point to their <laughs> legs and I'll reassure them, especially if the patient was being induced and had a longer induction or had a C-section that they probably got more, you know, IV fluid at once than they usually will drink in an average day. And, you know, if their kidney and heart are working well, they will get rid of that fluid. But sometimes it takes a few days and... Sometimes the th second or third day after a delivery or C-section, it can actually get the swelling in their legs can get worse before it gets better. So yeah. I reassure them of that. I also do give them, especially if they're, let's say, otherwise doing well and going to go home, I do give them some precautions about swelling. I tell patients that the swelling should be about the same in both legs and that if they're at home and they suddenly notice that one leg just blows up and is much more swollen than the other or really tender they should give us a call because th that could be a sign of a blood clot in that leg. But if they're having just symmetrical swelling in both legs, that's most likely fluid retention and that, that should get better. I also tell patients that if they're getting suddenly worsening swelling, like things are fine and suddenly the next couple of days their arms and their legs get more swollen and they're having some other symptoms like headache, blurry vision, they should call us just to make sure that they don't have preeclampsia. But you know, lower lower leg swelling is is common in so many different things. So it's not, I reassure patients, it's not a sign that you're, you know, in everything else being good, your blood pressure being normal. It's not a sign that you're getting preeclampsia. And I, I totally agree that it's, it, it frequently gets worse before it gets better. Like people who had swelling and they're like, oh, thank God I delivered. It's going to go away. I always warn them. It may get actually worse than this before it gets better. And if they didn't have swelling or didn't have a lot of it, everyone has some swelling, it may get, it may again be worse right after they deliver and then eventually go away. And it, it is hard because there is there is overlap with that and preeclampsia that one of the signs of preeclampsia is increased swelling. But since so many people have swelling after delivery, it freaks a lot of people out that they may have preeclampsia. And it's, it's really not the case. And we're checking people's blood pressure in the hospital until they go home. And if anyone's really concerned, we could always bring them in and check it or they could check it at home. But if it, the blood pressure is normal, there's really no danger to them having swelling. And we don't recommend giving people like diuretics which we give, you know, which is sort of medical patients who have heart conditions and liver conditions and they have swelling, they take diuretics, get rid of water. We don't recommend that. It's going to get better on its own anyways. And there's some downsides to the diuretics. So we don't give those. We just sort of say, wait, elevate your legs. It's going to go away eventually. And that's, and that is an important thing. And I agree the the non-symmetric swelling, particularly if one leg is also in pain and red and tender, doesn't mean there's a blood clot, but it's something that we would want to just evaluate and see what's going on. And then what do you tell people about using the bathroom? Like, you know, whether it's urinating or having a bowel movement, is that something they should be very worried about? Or is it something that's going to cause pain or, you know, based on their tear? What do you what do you tell them about that? I think that's another thing that some patients are actually terrified about, mainly if they had a vaginal delivery. But even some mm -hmm. patients with a C-section, I think people are afraid that they're going to just like hurt something if that if when that happens. So what I what I tell patients is I, I really try to encourage being on like a bowel regimen that will not prevent constipation because I think that it can just add to the general discomfort. And practically speaking, for women, especially if they do have a perineal tear, that's more what we call a third degree or fourth degree, where they had to have stitches on the like the anal sphincter muscle, or um, the, the, if the tear was a fourth degree and went through to the rectum. But even if it's not that severe, I'll tell them that they should take some sort of stool softener just so that when they do go to the bathroom, it will be easier. But I'll reassure them that th they're not going to to hurt themselves, that even with the repair in that area, naturally just going to the bathroom, having valve movements, as long as they wipe gently and again, clean the area with a spray bottle, their stitches should still heal fine. Right. And the, in terms of like for, for urinating, it's rarely an issue because rarely there are stitches that high up. 
Occasionally there are, in which case we tell them it may burn a little bit when they go the first time, but generally that's not a concern. When they have a bowel movement, again, it's it's not so much that it's going to open the stitches, even though people are afraid of that. Uh, people are very, very ginger about touching the area, so they're worried about wiping and this. And so I tell them very similar, I say, do whatever you can to not be constipated. And whether it's taking a stool softener, eating extra fiber, particularly if they're taking more pain medicine, like dilaudid, the narcotics can cause constipation. Tylenol and Motrin tend not to. So that's, you know, to be sure that, and then if they are uncomfortable wiping or they feel like it's not adequate and the air is not clean, to use a spray bottle or just like plan your shower after a bowel movement just to make sure that everything is clean and you feel comfortable and the stitches, the area is clean. But it, it's not actually a concern on our end. It's just people are very, they're sore or they're afraid, which makes sense. And, and usually people will get through that. And then one of the other things that happens during those few, first few days, and sometimes also fortunately during the first few hours is they, they start nursing potentially. If they're going to be, either they're going to be feeding the baby the bottle or they're going to be nursing. And that's a whole other you know story that they're starting at that time, which just adds to the potential stress or questions, or sometimes it goes great and it's just, you know, wonderful bonding. But for many women, that's particular in their first baby, that can become a very stressful event. And how, you know, in terms of how do you guide women through that or help them or answer their questions? So for breastfeeding, I, I try to offer a lot of reassurance. And one thing that I tell patients, I think some women still expect that their milk is going to come in really fast. And I tell patients that it usually takes two or three days for the milk to come in. And also just reassure them that baby's stomachs are very small when right. they're newborn. And many women are very worried that their baby is not getting enough nutrition. And it is something that we need to pay attention to. That's one of the reasons why the nursery weighs the baby every day. And we encourage patients to follow up with a pediatrician really within a few days after delivery just to weigh the baby again to make sure the baby baby's weight is not dropping significantly. But overall, for most patients, the they are going to get colostrum the first, first day or two. And then as the more they try to breastfeed or pump, the more it'll trigger milk to come in. But they shouldn't necessarily... And you know, we do have a lactation consultant at, at right. Mount Sinai that will see patients the first day, but they shouldn't feel concerned that they need to jump to a bottle within the first couple days if they feel like they're not actually like making enough milk. The postpartum nurses, they, they're doing this all day with patients, so they're very knowledgeable and they have a lot of experience. There are lactation consultants who have an additional layer of experience. There's also a lot of resources from people go home, whether it's with personalized service, people come to your house or going back to classes or online. And there's, you know, so many resources. But like you said, it's not like the second the baby's born, there's milk, you know, coming out. And the colostrum is a very small volume. It's, you know, high in nutrients and it's high in antibodies and it's a wonderful thing, but it's a pretty low volume that comes out. But as I said, the, the baby's stomach is smaller than a golf ball. Uh, I mean, there's not a lot in there. It's it, They don't have to take a lot in order to be fed. And again, it's one of these things that, you know, a lot of people are understandably concerned is my baby I'm not getting enough? Am I not making enough milk? And that's where, you know, we're helpful to pediatricians just to make sure, like, it's totally fine to ask those questions and to see that everything's right, but usually everything's going to be perfectly fine. And that's a journey, obviously, that continues as they go home. In terms of a vaginal delivery, you know, most women go home uh, after a day or two. What is it that affects the decision of when women are going to be ready to go home after a vaginal delivery, And like in your mind? So what I usually check is, first of all, how is their general pain being controlled? And I don't just mean from a vaginal repair, like even just their, you know, just the cramping postpartum, because that can be pretty significant the first couple of days. If they're taking Tylenol and Motrin and are, are overall feeling well, then that's one that's one thing in favor of them going home. Their bleeding is a big is a big factor. I'll never discharge somebody who's bleeding, I feel, is not under control. If somebody is doing well but lost a significant amount of blood after delivery, that's someone that I might still have stay an extra day to to keep an eye on just because I I don't want that patient going home and suddenly now they're in their either in their home environment and they're walking around and then they're feeling dizzy and lightheaded where you know in the hospital work you know moving in the confines of a small postpartum room they're not walking as much and they they actually feel okay. So amount of bleeding, how much bleeding they lost at delivery, if they didn't lose that much blood at delivery and they're not dizzy or lightheaded, that's another reason that they could go home even, you know, sometimes 24 hours after delivery. Check patient's blood pressure. Occasionally, some women will develop high blood pressure 
postpartum, even who did not have any issues pre-delivery, postpartum preeclampsia can happen. And so if somebody, there have been times where I've been almost ready to discharge someone and then I came up to see them and their blood pressure suddenly spiked up. So that's a reason why we would hold someone in the hospital. But if, if the blood pressure is normal, then, you know, even in, in patients that had blood pressure that was high earlier, I'll have patients sometimes check it at home if it's otherwise been fine and just report back to us. So those are really, you know, if the if otherwise the their general pain is is under good control, they're eating and drinking, you know, their blood pressure is normal, they're not bleeding too much. You know, I, I look at their legs and maybe they're swelling, but I don't have any concern for a blood clot. Those are patients that I'd feel comfortable going home. One thing I will actually touch on also, which again is a whole topic in and of itself, is just, you know, mood, depression. I, I definitely assess that when I round postpartum. And it's completely normal to have, you know, tearfulness and some feelings of, especially if it was a, if the patient had a difficult delivery. But I always just make sure that I feel if, if a patient had a rough delivery or, you know, even if I knew that pre-delivery they were having a lot of life stressors, that they do have good support and follow-up at home. Sometimes we'll have one of the social workers come speak with patients. And some of the patients actually already have relationships with the social workers through prior counseling, just to make sure that they're, you know, they're okay going home, that they feel, you know, comfortable leaving the hospital. Right. I, I agree with all that. And I think one of the important lessons of this is that it really has to be individualized. I mean, someone could say, all right, you have a vaginal delivery, you go home in two days, whatever that is. And okay, that's appropriate for many people. But, you know, there are some women who are ready to go home in eight hours and some women who aren't ready to go home for eight days. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, you can look at what's typical or what's average, but it really has to be appropriate for the individual person. So for example, if someone had a, it's their third baby, they have no tears, they're nursing great, their blood pressure is fine, they're healthy, they have no pain, they feel great. Like, honestly, they could go home like once they can walk. There's right. nothing wrong, but typically they don't. They yeah, do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Typically they don't because the, the, the hospital actually likes to observe the babies for 24 hours because certain things can happen with newborns right at the 24-hour mark. They like to sort of observe them there. But for the mother's side, she's frequently ready to go home, you know, right away in six hours. I and mean, listen, people deliver at home and then they recover at home. And so it's, if they get through the birth fine and the baby's fine, there's, you know, the recovery process can be at home. But then there's other women, like you said, who are having much more pain than that other woman is, or she has a fever or her blood pressure is high, or she had more blood loss. And then to just like kick her out at two days, because two days is hit, is really not appropriate either, because there's things that she may need. She may need medicine for blood pressure. She may like I said, have a mood disorder. She may be having, you know, uh, fevers and need antibiotics. She may need a blood transfusion. She may need more medications to stop bleeding. She may, you know, there's so many variables that we look at. And so, yes, most women will go home on average one to two days after a vaginal delivery, but that's really just the, you know, the point of the bell curve. There's definitely people who are ready to go home much earlier. And there's people who are certainly not ready to go home and need to wait a little bit longer. And again, that's not failure on their part. It's just, it is what it is. Different people have different uh, events happen to them at delivery and need different recovery. No different from any other operation you have. They can say, what is the typical time to go home after X operation? But it's not mandated. Some people are ready to go home earlier and some people, they're just not ready to go home until later. And, and that's an important thing also why we like to evaluate people after delivery. So, you know, there are places where you sort of deliver and then the doctor's gone. And you never see the doctor ever again. And then just sort of hospital says, okay, the nurses will do A, B, and C. And then you go home in X amount of days. And that's going to work for most people, but it's going to be staying too long for some and not long enough for others. And so we really, we stay involved. And I mean, most of the doctors I know stay involved after delivery as well, but that's an important uh, point. And then once once people are actually at home, all right, so they've they've passed all your criteria, they're doing okay, and they go home, what are the things that they should either expect in terms of the, again, for vaginal delivery, what is the, the expectations in terms of the time to feeling more normal, the times to feeling like themselves or recovering uh, physically? Uh, that's number one. And then what are the warning signs that people should really, you know, focus on and, you know, make sure to call to attention if they're occurring? It's a good question with just going to the first question of when should women expect to kind of feel more more normal? Because I think also it really depends on the type of vaginal delivery they had. Right. I think that, you know, I've had some patients with a vaginal delivery that was, you know, really, let's say, challenging. They pushed for a long time. They had a more significant vaginal tear, have a longer recovery than some patients that have had a, a C-section. 
So I, I kind of tailor that also, if I know someone had a, just again, a, a long labor, a long, we're pushing for a long time, I'll tell them that, you know, it may take you longer to feel, you know, pain-free and kind of back to yourself than maybe someone else who had a vaginal delivery. And that's, that's okay. That's pretty, pretty typical. I think for most patients, let's say take an average vaginal delivery with a small perineal tear. Most people with like a, let's say a week after delivery will say that they overall feel like much better, not a hundred percent. They'll still have soreness where they had the repair. They'll still have cramping when they breastfeed, although it might be getting less from the first few days. Their bleeding may have tapered off, although I tell patients that they can expect sometimes you know, nine or 10 days after they leave the hospital to suddenly kind of have a day where they bleed more and then that tapers off again and, and not to be alarmed by that unless, and we'll go over the warning signs more, but unless they're really soaking through pads of blood. Dealing with a newborn, they, they, they're they gonna feel, you know, being run down and exhausted is is very normal. So I, I think that that's a big factor in sometimes women not feeling well. And I think even if someone's actually having a pretty otherwise like, you know, physically okay recovery, like I'll sometimes see patients coming in for concerns about something. And then, and I'll also speak with them of just about how they're doing in general, you know, sleep wise. And obviously they're, you know, they're not sleeping. And I think that that kind of can escalate how you, mm -hmm. how everything else feels. So if you have any pain, it, you know, it can seem sometimes worse. I tell patients that probably the, the first week will be the hardest. They should steadily improve. By the time they'll see me, you know, at, at a six week visit, most women at that point are really just still dealing with the newborn sleep issues. And, and probably the most common issue that I talk to patients about is just mood. Yeah. Um, but actually, from a physical standpoint, by then, most women are actually pretty pleasantly surprised at how they've recovered. I will say that I definitely have some patients that, again, just had like a significant vaginal or perineal repair that that may have completely healed. But and this, again, you can do a whole other talk about like, you know, pelvic floor you know, right. issues. But I tell patients that s some women will have issues with, um, you know, incontinence and pelvic floor weakness. And even some women still have some pain at the perineal repair several weeks out, even if it's completely healed. I can't even tell sometimes that there was ever a tear there, but they'll still say, you know, I, I still feel some pain there. And, and they'll feel bad and kind of wonder like, oh, maybe it's just me. Is this normal? You know, again, all, all my friends, everyone on Instagram seems to be <laughs> <laughs> running marathons six weeks postpartum. Um, so in those cases, I'll refer patients to a pelvic floor physical therapist and talk. There's some other options that we'll talk about as well. I agree. I tell people that from a vaginal delivery, within a week or two, most people will feel like 80% of themselves physically. At the, I mean, the issue with sleep, again, continues and obviously mood. Some people have no issues. Some people have severe depression and there's everything in between, obviously. And where that crosses from normal to sort of quote unquote abnormal is, you know, it's not always clear, but you know, there's definitely points where it's, where it's problematic and, you know, requires treatment, but in terms of physical recovery, yeah, usually 80% you're back to yourself within a week or two. And like you said, almost everybody by six weeks feels normal physically with the exceptions. You said some people have some lingering pains, some people have, you know, various things and that, that does happen. It's normal in terms of during that first week, you know, I tell them the same thing. We, you know, in terms of instructions, like we tell them not to lift anything crazy. Most people aren't going to power lift or move furniture around after they deliver it. It's not like we're telling them to do something they would normally do. Women, they could pick up their babies, they could yeah. pick up the, you know, the car seat, the baby bag, like the groceries, whatever the things they would normally pick up. You know, in terms of physical activity, we're pretty, you know, for vaginal delivery, we're usually pretty liberal. People can start, you know, based on how they feel. If they're up to it, they can start doing activities. We usually tell them not to have sex until after the postpartum visit. Whether that's necessary or not is sort of debatable, but most women aren't, you know, arguing <laughs> that point. They're like, okay, good. But that's that's really it instruction wise. And then like the warning signs, you know, obviously, like you said, some days that are heavier bleeding is normal, but we give them instructions about, you know, how much is too much, like, you know, soaking a pad every 30 minutes is really is really more than we would expect. Again, it doesn't mean there's a problem or something has to be done, but it's just something we would like to know about. Obviously, fevers we want to know about, you know, issues with nursing. Sometimes people, you know, women get breast infections uh, or urine infections or, you know, if they feel like there's something wrong with the, uh, you know, the tear that they had, the stitches are, you know, coming loose in a way that seems abnormal or they think it's infected. And these are things people can call for, but most people don't have that. Most people have 
very few unusual things. Uh, like you said, the one leg suddenly gets swollen versus another. Again, these are things or they have signs of preeclampsia, like they have headaches and, you know, we can have them check their blood pressure at home pretty easily or they can come to our office. That's, I think, a pretty good summary of what to expect after a vaginal delivery. Did I, did I forget anything? Did we forget anything? No, I think, I think yeah. we covered pretty much yeah. most of the things I was thinking about. Everything we said applies to a cesarean delivery, although the one thing, I guess the one bonus of having a cesarean is very often not always, they won't have a, a tear vaginally. Uh, occasionally they do if they were like pushed and then had a C-section, but really almost everybody does not. Maybe they're a little swollen if they were further in labor, but not the same types of like care. So they have an incision on their belly, which is very, for people who don't know with a C-section, the incision is almost always very low down. It's across the belly around where the hairline is. So like meaning if someone's wearing underwear or a bikini, you would not see the scar from a C-section. That's how low down it is. And it's about as wide, I don't know, like whatever 10 centimeters is, maybe the the size of a can of soda sort of sideways. I don't know. It's about 10. Just enough to get the baby's head. Yeah. It, we, it's, oh. it's as small as we, as we can make it. And so for those women, what additional things do we tell them about in terms of the immediate time after delivery? Like what additional things are we worried about or we warn them about or we talk to them about? So while they're in the hospital, I, I definitely have a talk about pain control. And sometimes I'll even come to the recovery area after just to say a quick hello. And usually at that time, they're they're doing well. If they had an epidural in labor and then had a C-section, or if they have a, you know, if they have a spinal, um, if it was a scheduled C-section, they'll often have pain medication through the, let's say, through the spinal that's actually still working and will work for kind of delayed release over the next 24 hours. So often the first day, many women are, are pretty comfortable, but I will talk to them about that. And again, say that once this wears off, you will have incisional pain, which is separate from even the cramping that you're right. still going to have. Right. So there's the cramping and which they'll notice when they start to try to breastfeed, which in and of itself can be really uncomfortable. Plus they'll also have the incisional pain. So I'll encourage them again to start taking the Tylenol and Motrin. And I'll even tell them to take the Motrin, which we have prescribed really around the clock. Right. Um, as long as they don't have any, you know, an allergy to it, obviously, but just to, to take it every six hours, even if they're actually feeling okay, so they can just stay on top of the pain. And I also will tell them definitely, you know, I think many women really want to avoid taking narcotics. Like they kind of say, well, I'm just going to take the Motrin and, and that's it. And I'll say this is this is definitely while you're in the hospital, the time to actually take the Dilaudid because you're here in a monitored setting. Right. Um, so if you take it and it, you're really drowsy, you'll know, OK, you know, maybe I'll take less or or try to avoid it. But I tell them the first day or two, take it because the you know, the pain will slowly get better. Um, but if you, if you let the pain get ahead of you, it's much harder to get on top of it than if you stay on top of it. So right. I really encourage the Dilaudid for women that are breastfeeding. Some of them try to avoid the Dilaudid because they, you know, traces of it may get into the breast milk. And I'll, I'll say to them that if you, if you take a couple doses a day, the amount that would get into the breast milk is not going to cause any harm to the baby. Right. Um, and not to, not to avoid it for that reason. Right. And I think there's so, such an important point there that a lot of people don't uh, realize because don't think about it is that. Ironically, for a cesarean delivery, the time right after delivery is much less painful. Yeah. Because so when you have a vaginal delivery, even if you had an epidural, pretty much right when you deliver or right when the repair is done, they turn the epidural off. And so within two, three hours, uh, the sensation in the legs is back and any pain you were going to have, you're going to have. So, okay, a vaginal delivery typically has less pain than the cesarean delivery, but you're going to start getting it either right away at delivery or when the epidural wears off, which is two hours later. When you have a C-section, there's it's it's a bigger incision, it's a bigger recovery, there's more pain. But when they do the anesthetic for it, and 99% of the time you're either have an epidural or a spinal, they inject something there. It's called, well, the one they use at Mount Sinai is called Duramorph, but it's basically a 24-hour morphine that goes in. So you have pain medicine in your nervous system for a day from when they start. So even though it's a bigger sort of event or operation, the first 24 hours typically are not very painful for women after a cesarean delivery because they have a lot of coverage. On the flip side, they're less mobile. It's harder to walk around. 
it's harder to get out of bed compared to vaginal delivery. So there's a plus and a minus, but sort of the expectation of like, oh, I'm going to come out of surgery and have horrible pain and I'm, you have to get narcotics like left and right is actually not the case for a cesarean. If someone has to have general anesthesia, yeah, that's what they, I was gonna say. Yeah, they don't get anything in their spine for anesthesia and it's just general, then yes, they will wake up and like most surgical patients have pain right away from when they wake up and they have to get a lot of narcotics. They tend to be more because of that, there's more side effects. They're more, you know, groggy in this, but that's fortunately not typical. So if you have an epidural or a spinal, the first 24 hours tend to be okay, which is nice because even though you had surgery, you're you're awake, alert, you're, you know, you didn't frequently, didn't just go through pushing and a repair and you can hold your baby and smile and take pictures. And it's not like, you know, you don't look like a typical post-operative patient. We do try to get people out of bed after cesarean as well the first day, whether it's, you know, six hours, eight hours, whatever, later, take out the catheter and have them try to, you know, go to the bathroom. But the next day after surgery, 24 to 48 hours later, that's when the pain frequently kicks in. And like you said, people, A, a lot of them walk into it saying, hey, I want to take as little pain medicine as possible, either because they think it's going to hurt the baby or because just in general, and they just had 24 hours with not so much pain. They're like, I could do this. Right. And then I always warn them, like, tomorrow will be worse. Like, you'll have more pain and walking around hurts and going to the bathroom hurts. And so the other thing people sometimes do say, I'm just going to stay still. I'm not going to move. Right. And it's generally the tenants, it's better to take pain medicine and move around than it is to take nothing and just stay still all day because in the recovery process, it's moving. So some some people are like more than happy to take whatever we have and they're just like please give me more but a lot of people we have to convince them like hey like i'd rather you take more pain medicine and then start moving around better cuz you'll heal faster and your ultimate recovery will be better as compared to staying around um and that's a big difference between c-sections and vaginal deliveries later to get out of bed later for the pain to start but they're going to need more pain medicine once that starts happening compared to vaginal delivery, because they also have the cramping, even with the, they have the incision pain and the cramping. The wound actually is pretty straightforward for a C-section because it doesn't, you know, it's nothing's going near there when you go to the bathroom. So that's not an issue. It's just about showering and we take the bandage off and they can shower and that's it. Like we just tell them, don't, don't scrub it. And that's fine. And we, we have these little, what's called steri strips on the wound, which are these little like Daryl bandages and they stay on for a couple of weeks and they can shower with them. Soap can get on them. Water can get on them. And we just pat dry it with the towel. So that's actually, it's easier than people think the wound care after a C-section. Yeah. I try to demystify the incision because I, I know that probably one of the moments, if it's someone's first C-section, they'll be terrified initially when I say I'm going to take the bandage off. Right. Because I think they just don't want to <laughs> right. know Right. They think their intestines there. are going to come out with the bandage exactly. and they're going to have to like, like poke their liver back in. And that that that, that doesn't happen much. And yeah. for for, some, for many women, this is the first surgery they've ever had. For some for some women, look, their delivery is the first time they were ever in a hospital. Right. Um, and it's the first surgery. It's the first incision they've ever had. So the one thing I reassure them is when I take the bandage off, as you said, there are steri strips that are covering the incision. I also tell them that the steri strips are not holding you together. Right. That the incision is stitched closed and that the stitches also will dissolve, but they'll take a while to dissolve. So by the time they dissolve, the incision will be healed. So even if steri strips fall off, they don't have to worry that the incision is just going to pop open. Right. You know, sometimes there can be complications with incisions healing, but I tell them that it's not. If the steri strips, you know, if I could take a steri strip off now and the incision would still be, you know, holding together. Right. If the patient's support person or partner is open to looking at the incision, I'll have them actually look just so they have a baseline idea of how things are. I'll show them, you know, this is what looks normal so that if there is any concern when they go home, you know, because it is hard to look at one's own incision. And and some women honestly have said, I'm not even going to look in the mirror. I'm too scared to look at the incision. And I'll encourage them to, but at right. least someone else can take a look and, and see what normal is. Right, right. And then the, what Sarah was saying is we, the way we close our C-sections is with stitches that dissolve and then everything's closed. And then when everything is done, we put these, you know, steri strips on top of everything, meaning they're, they're not supportive in terms of like holding it together. We just, we do it because it keeps it covered and it maybe keeps it clean. Whatever we used to use, we, like a lot of people used to use staples and some people do, which is fine, but there's some advantages to the stitches, which is why we do that. One of the advantages is no one has to look at the wound because it right. just, they dissolve and it heals. And the, we tell people to take those steri strips, those little bandages off at home, typically when the baby's two weeks old. Sometime by that point, they're usually getting 
brown and cruddy and starting to fall off anyways, like an old Band-Aid. And then we just don't peel off in the shower. People sometimes are squeamish about that, but it's not painful and there's Nothing's going to happen. And then by that time, it's two weeks, the skin is healed, and there's really nothing going on. There there are rare circumstances when someone is concerned, maybe the wound has like a hole, like it's open at certain points, or maybe it's infected because there's some drainage or it looks a little red. And if they have that, we just tell them to come on in and we take a look. And most of the time it's not, and it's fine. And occasionally if it is, then we deal with it. It happens, I would say, the the likelihood of a complication from the wound is under 5%. It ha- so it happens, but it's, and if it does, it's treatable. It's just annoying. And so those are the things we warn people about with the wound. And usually it's it's not like someone's going to have a complication from the wound and not know about it. You know, if, if it's, if there's a hole in their belly, they'll know. And if there's something, you know, draining out of it, they'll know. And if they have fevers and it's red, they'll know. So there isn't much like, you know, we don't have required inspections of the wound that they have to do. They just sort of know. And then for pain, usually for people when they go home from a C-section, what do you do about pain medicine at home? So you said in the hospital, they take Tylenol, they take Motrin, which is ibuprofen and maybe a narcotic like Dilaudid. When they go home, how many women need to continue the narcotic when they go home? You said after vaginal delivery, they, they almost always don't. But after a C-section, is it most women, some women? What, what do you find in your practice? I think that most women need it at least in the first couple days when they go home. I have had patients tell me that they never used it. And I think they honestly just had good pain control with the Motrin and, and Tylenol. And that's fine. But I think that most people probably... Like when I talk to them later, we'll say like the first two or three days home, even if they didn't take it in the hospital, they took it. And and then there are, of course, patients that are, you know, and I say this as a, as a credit to them. They're they're like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not going to let myself be uncomfortable. I'm just going to take it. And they, they may use it more, not because anything was going wrong, but just because they really, really want to stay on top of things. So I think that most women end up using it at some point. Probably about a week, week and a half out. Most women by then, if otherwise their incisions healing well, tend to like either not be using it or, or using it pretty infrequently. And again, I tell patients like if you need it occasionally in the first, you know, even the first couple weeks, that's not a bad thing. I would I would expect though that your pain is steadily getting better. So if it's a week and a half later and you feel your pain is severe every day and you're using Dilaudid every day and without needing less of it, I would definitely want to see you because then I would just want to take a look at your incision right. and make sure there's not a problem. And many times, you know, there's there's not. It's just that patient, you know, is just really trying to stay on top of the pain or have, to, or also some women have to be more active when they get home, even if they're following our post-surgery instructions and not lifting. They may be walking a lot. They may have right. kids. Everyone they may live in a walk-up. I mean, right. there's so many variables. And I think it's also so, it's so important to just take a minute and talk about opioids, you know, narcotics or however, you know, you refer to them. But this has been such a a, a complicated topic for post-surgical pain relief, you know, and it's gone in so many different directions. So when I was training and when I was younger, we basically, we assumed that most women after delivery, after a C-section would need narcotics in the hospital and then need like you said, someone needed home, some wouldn't, and we'd sort of figure it out. And then there became this very big push, uh, and this is in the U.S. mostly, that we weren't, we, not like we, but like all doctors, were not addressing pain well enough, that we were sort of blowing off patients' pain. And so there was a very big push to sort of ask every patient in the hospital, how much pain are you in? And they have these scales one to 10, and then the frowny face or the medium face or the smiley face. So you didn't have to do a number and all these different, always asking patients, are you in pain? Are you in pain? Are you in pain? And treating it, which is a good thing, right? That's obviously motivated, you know, by good intentions and by keeping people comfortable and out of pain. But what happened was because of that, and it was, it was sort of such a big focus that people started getting more and more and more and more narcotics after surgery and specifically in this situation after C-section. And so people would get it around the clock when they were in the hospital and then they would be sent home with like three weeks worth. And and listen, their pain was great, right? They didn't have any pain. But then we've had this whole issue with opioid dependency that if you take narcotics for a long time, your body will eventually get used to it. And then it sort of has a bad outcome where you Now, if you don't take it, you're in pain. If that's what a dependency is, your body is dependent on it to just be normal. 
And like people have that with coffee. Sometimes if you take coffee every day after a certain point, yes. you feel bad if you don't take your coffee and you're just taking your coffee to get back to baseline. So that can happen with narcotics and it becomes very dangerous. And it's, you know, it's been labeled a crisis in this country, an epidemic, all these things. So then there was a flip back the other direction. Okay, don't give anybody narcotics. And now people are in like pain. And I think that just like we said before, discharging people, there is sort of a typical amount, but everybody's different. And so many studies have looked at individualizing how much pain medicine someone needs, which is obviously makes a lot of sense. If someone needs less, give them less. And if someone needs more, give them more. And you have to be involved in terms of asking them and talking about it. And I think that it's, again, ultimately the conclusion is people should take them if they need them and they should not take them if they don't need them, which is true for most medications. And I think that having a policy where everyone gets the same amount, whether it's zero or a lot or in the middle, is just not going to work. You're going to be giving some people too little and some people too much, and it requires work. It requires the doctors and the nurses, and everyone is sort of asking people exactly what they need and figuring it out. And that's what we do. We really, it, it's unusual for someone to not need any narcotics at all, in the first few days, it happens. Like you said, a few people are okay with just Tylenol Motrin and good, but that's the exception. And most people, when they go home, probably take it to some degree, whether it's one day, two days, several days a week, but it should be getting less over time. It should, their pain should be getting better. Someone who, there are people who may need it for more than a week, but we find out why and what is going on. And I just think that's a very important point to stress that it, there isn't one right answer to say that we should always be giving it or never be giving it. It has to be individualized, like everything. But this is just, and I think that there was, from good intentions, I think that we swung too far in every direction in this. And I think we have to really be more precise for who needs what. And it means you have to talk to people and figure it out. You can't just like run around and give everyone the same prescription like sometimes happens. No, definitely. Some patients may be fine getting five tabs of Dilaudid. Some people may need... 30 tabs of Dilaudid to carry them through the next couple of weeks. Right. I think that a lot of the issue with the opioid crisis was also that many people had leftover narcotic pills from prior surgeries right. and sometimes would take it or family members or friends would take it when they just had, when they had other pains and, and then would get addicted to it. So I also talk to patients just if they have leftover, I've sometimes brought up like make sure to dispose of them, you know, properly. And, and we've also had you know, some patients over the, like I've had patients over the years who actually did have a prior opioid dependency before right. their pregnancy and um, you know, recovered, but were very concerned when they were going to deliver about how they would manage their pain. And especially if they had a C-section and needed narcotic medication, they really did not want to go home with any narcotic medication. And in those situations will usually have the patient see a pain management specialist just so that, you know, we can try to maximize their pain control. They, and I tell them, you may still need some narcotic medication while you're in the hospital, but let's see what we can do to just, you know, control the amount you, you get just so, you know, you get just enough that you need. And even when you leave the hospital, also, you know, get just the amount that you need at the time instead of, you know, maybe going home with a prescription for pain medication, maybe just getting like a very small amount right. periodically having much closer follow-up. So, you know, even someone with a prior opioid dependency still shouldn't be in pain, you know, after their, right. after their delivery. Right. And it has to be, you know, it, it's, it has to be a thoughtful process, both from the patient's perspective and the doctor's perspective to make sure we're not prescribing too much. We're not prescribing too little. And if you're not sure, you can always under prescribe and then follow up in a day or two and read it, you know, it takes time, but it's obviously worth it because preventing either an original dependence or a recurrence of a dependence is so huge. It changes someone's life and you really have to be on top of those things. And that's that's important. Once they go home and sort of the, the initial week or two is, is past them, I, I tell people that the recovery is basically then the same from a vaginal delivery, but slower. Meaning after a week or two from a C-section, people will again usually feel about 80% of themselves, maybe some more pain around the incision than a vaginal delivery would have. But then to get to 100%, it definitely takes another one to two months. And it's frequent that people at the six-week mark still don't feel perfectly themselves. Some do, but after C-section, some people, they're still like, I'm not quite there yet, you know? And so that's why like with physical activity, we tend to tell people and they tend to be a little more slow and a little more ginger with restarting their physical activities after C-section. It's not the fear that if they, you know, overdo it, their incision is going to blow open. It's it's really just more so it can be more pain or they'll have more, you know, fatigue. And so we just tell them to 
take it slower and start and see how you're doing. And they may not be ready at six weeks to go to full activities. It may take them a few more weeks. And that's fine. It was a major operation. I mean, this is it's a it's a big deal to have a C-section. Fortunately, they're safe and people do well, but it's people should expect that the recovery is going to take some time. And if it doesn't, they're very fortunate, but they should expect that it should. Yeah, I think even when the incision is perfectly healed, it's still very sensitive. Yeah. Um, a lot of patients have numb areas or the yeah. numbness and tingling as the nerves heal. And sometimes even like, for example, if they have they're holding their baby or another child like sits in their lap, they'll yeah. tell me that <laughs> like, ow, they yeah. you know, even two months later, they'll kind of feel like wince a bit. Yeah. So I'll tell them that if they do want to start exercising again, we definitely have some patients that are very motivated to start exercising. I'll say just really like listen to your body, take it easy, try to avoid doing a lot of crunches, not necessarily because you're going to like hurt anything or injure anything, but it's just not going to be the most comfortable exercise to do. It may take you a few months before you really feel you can do something like that, but you can do other things like you know, if you're into running, you can definitely start running again. Yeah. Um, you could use some light weights. Like, just don't expect to necessarily jump right back to even where you were. You know, exercising in the in the pregnancy necessarily, if you were doing that. Right. Wow, Sarah, this is great. This was thorough. I think we really covered a lot about recovery, yeah, vaginal I feel like delivery, and a C-section. Two hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's well, it's important. It, it comes up every day. Hopefully this podcast is something that women can use either before they have a delivery to sort of prepare or afterwards. If you're, you know, up at three in the morning feeding your baby and you got you want to listen to something, we're here for you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, I think the one take home mm -hmm. I really want to stress to everyone who's just had a baby, whether you had a vaginal delivery or C-section is I think that now with social media, you know, it gives us a chance to post, oh, like, you know, like you, someone may look and this friend had a baby, that friend had a baby, their sister had a baby. And again, you see like the very rosy side of the recovery. Right. And I think that everyone needs to understand that like, I see that it's not the case. Yeah. And I reassure everyone. <laughs> that's that's not, not typical. <laughs> not to feel bad if they see like, why is this person like, you know, she she looks like she's having such an easy recovery. Again, am I doing something wrong? Right. And, and actually, you're just seeing probably that person's struggling as well. And and just to reassure themselves that most likely they're doing you know totally fine. Um, right. Definitely get in touch with your doctor if you have any concerns. But d don't feel bad if you feel like you're got hit by a truck. Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> which is which is how most people feel. I think that's the norm. Is man, I got hit by a truck. That was awful. Yeah. And so that's yeah. I think that the rosy Instagram pictures are either false that they're just like taking their very best moment of their very best day, or they're very lucky. And they're the exception. And all the other people who are like at home or in hospital miserable are just not posting about yes, it. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. Well, th thank you so much for the great message. And thanks for coming on. And I'm sure we'll have you on many more times. Yeah. And until you, until you believe you're really good at it. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman Podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.